Welcome to Foreign Countries, Conversations in Archaeology with me, Ash Lenton. If you're enjoying Foreign Countries and you want to hear more episodes, please become a patron of the show for just $2 a month. Go to the website and click the patron button, foreigncountries.podbean.com. In putting together this season on the early medieval, I've noticed a growing trend in the research of burial archaeology, and that is a dissatisfaction with the overemphasis on metal weapons and jewellery in the graves. A number of authors have said that other materials, or the lack of materials, as well as the arrangements of burials, traditionally have been overlooked, and that has severely limited thinking in the research. At least that's the impression I've got, so I've decided to try and redress that a little more in this final episode. So later on, I'll be talking to Dr Claire Rainsford about faunal remains as grave goods in the east of England, and then to Femke Lippock about cremation burials in the Netherlands and Belgium. My first guest is Sue Harrington, who is Honorary Professor at UCL Institute of Archaeology. I'm talking to Sue about a paper in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal called Theatres of Closure, which she co-authored with Stuart Brooks, Sarah Semple and Andrew Millard. So welcome, Sue. This paper looks at a number of ways to analyse early Saxon period graves without recourse to the metal objects. But can you tell me first where this paper came from? Because it's part of a much broader stream of research. The Theatre of Closure paper is really just a staging post along a quite a lengthy process of perhaps over the last 25 years, which was a collaborative idea between myself and Stuart Brooks to produce a census of early Anglo-Saxon people based on the idea that if we record everybody we're in a much better position to understand about those people rather than top slicing it. So that project which is a combined database that we produced as part of our PhDs is called the Anglo-Saxon Kent Electronic Database which is available to download from the ADS and that was just Kent I think there's 120 cemetery sites there with people and objects. Later on, I was involved with the Tribal Hydish Project with the late Dr. Martin Welsh, which was to expand that database over southern Britain and record all the burials and people and objects as a resource for asking some particular research questions about the economic basis of those communities and their relative wealth. Um, We have records in there of about 12,000 individuals, plus a notional idea that there's another 6,000 people lurking about who haven't been recorded properly. The outcome of that was the book that I took forward after Martin had died, The Early Anglo-Saxon Kingdoms of Southern Britain, which asked some questions about who had access to iron, who had access to the copper alloy, what were the age cohort. Six years later, we joined up with Sarah Semple at Durham, and we thought, why don't we look at Northumbria? But because of the particular skills that are are there in Durham, we'll have a scientific programme as well to do some isotope and DNA and and another radiocarbon dating project. The People and Place project, we're still writing up. So this Theatre of Closure paper is perhaps one of the first big outcomes to see what we could do with that data. But coming from a perspective where we weren't actually going to be sidetracked by metalwork, which has been the main focus of a lot of research. I say the Northumbria project added about another 6,000 people and much fewer in terms of objects, only about 6,000 objects from several hundred sites. So we were there in a position to say, well, how can we compare Northumbria, which has some areas that are very similar to Southern Britain, actually with Southern Britain, and to find a sort of common ground for comparison in this paper. But I think we started to show common themes, common differences, and talk about the real individuality of each burial community. From Northumbria and Southern Britain, there's a huge gap in the middle, which is the Midlands. But Stuart's been working on a project with Professor Chris Skull on Rendlesham, which is landscapes of lordship. And he has produced a similar database. So all of our data is in the same format and will eventually become publicly accessible. Tribal Hydage data is available via the Early Medieval Atlas on the UCL website. We've prepared the people and place data and that should be coming out hopefully this year. And it's all searchable. You can download it. You can do what you want with it. Essentially, as we've shown in the theatre of closure, is you have to take the data and do something with it. But it gives you the opportunity to ask a question and perhaps refine the data we've presented. I mean, there's a whole thing about dating, particularly of unfurnished burials. There are certain assumptions are made about those that 
I'm not sure that they're actually contemporary with furnished burial. So there's lots of questions, but the, the databases are a means of getting quick access to that information. So asking questions about spacing, staging, the placement of the body itself. There's an awful lot of information in a cemetery report. As I transcribed all of that data into the databases, I kept thinking, well, it's not entirely consistent the way these places have been recorded, but the things we do have are things like grave orientation, which people try to say has something to do with this rising sun or something. Nobody's really looked at the size and shape of graves, but they are very varied because if you turn every page, you think, well, hang on, that doesn't look like that one. Why is this a lot more regular? And it was really just to make a selection of those sorts of undiscussed elements that were there and actually quite well recorded visually. So that enabled Stuart and some volunteers to digitise the grave plans and digitise the body shape. And then we can do some statistics on various relationships between the two. So that's why we just desperately trying to get away from metalwork, you know, because of the whole thing about the criteria of the sword is the head one and the buckle is down the bottom. But from my perspective, as somebody who works on textiles and burial, I know that there's an awful lot of textile that we don't get recovered because it's just an organic that disappears. So we were trying to even that out and trying to say, well, what's the complexity of what's deposited with a person rather than giving it a hierarchy first off? And I think the idea that the sword burials don't have everything and have some of the stuff is quite an interesting outcome. It may be that the stuff we haven't got is the organics, and that's quite a difficult thing to assess. And how did you approach the case studies? What kind of scale was possible? One of the things we're very strong on is to, is to actually place all these burials in the landscape. So we've been to all of these sites, and I do remember standing at West Hesleton, which is on the Derwent Valley in North Yorkshire, and I said, this looks like the North Downs of Kent, where you have a scarp going up above a river, a valley, onto some higher ground, which is clearly for pastoral use, you know. I mean, Butler's Field Lechlade's another one. It's on a, a plateau above the River Thames, uh, uh, Lechlade in the West Country, but also has a very strong Roman influence around there. Mill Hill Deal, Kent, of course, has a lot of Roman stuff. And West Hesleton, of course, has Malton with its huge granary just up the road. So we just tried to compare... There was some sort of locational similarity between these sites. Also, Suaby, which is on the coast, similar to Mill Hill Deal, overlooking a transshipment point. Are they uniform at all? And we find that they're not. They have differences and nuances that perhaps are just glossed over. Any sort of uh, statement that says, well, this is a place that's got a lot of metalwork, this hasn't got very much, so it's poorer. But within the context of their own region, they're incredibly well furnished, but they are dealing with their burials in slightly different ways, which makes us suggest that there are other influences coming in or other influences allowed to continue. So what were you able to say about these multiple but very individual cemeteries? I think it's confirmed a lot of what had been suggested by researchers like Howard Williams in his Death and Memory book. What I think it, we've proved is actually very difficult to summarise any cemetery. I mean, in, in a way that is meaningful in context of another cemetery. They are very, very individual communities that are dealing with the whole theatre of dying in slightly different ways. And what we're trying to do is read off what evidence there is of the actions. The whole thing about the placement of bodies, which one of Sarah's PhD, Sean we I was looking at body position and she found tremendous variation on in her data sense, something like 28 different body positions, but with regional and cemetery specific positions in terms of we've only used uh, I think half a dozen here but she's got a much more refined you know where the hands are where the head is and that in a way speaks to how the body was deposited in the burial which led us on to the whole issue of whether there was empty space in the grave because sometimes the legs would be moved to one side now this could be post-deposition degradation of the body but also it could equally be there was something else in the grave that the body had to be fitted into so personally I tend to see these burials as a sort of hoarding process where the entirety of the person is deposited as part of the process of burial and I think we can see that in comparison with somewhere like Mill Hill Deal which is much more regimented and regularized in terms of how the bodies are placed the size of the graves are quite narrow so maybe that was not what was happening there. What about community patterns or cultural patterns even? 
And what's this coming in from the continent? I think they are dealing with things in their own way, which is why you do need this sort of forensic examination of the process of burial. I mean, you can always put a sort of spatial overlay to that because the Mill Hill site clearly is nearer to the continent and they seem to be much more rigid in what they're doing. And it, it gets more diffuse further away from that. When you assume there is contact with people in British West and North and the Lothians and what have you, I'm currently just musing on the issue of the problem, which, as I say, is, is AD 410, which is a cut-off problem but not the starting point for us. And, the, and it's why we try to do projects that, that span this time, because I'm currently looking at a site called High Down in West Sussex, which I was informed was an early Anglo-Saxon cemetery and seems to have an awful lot of Roman material in it, fourth century Roman, which is leading me to wonder, well, are we clearly saying that all of these cemeteries are Germanic? They start at about 450 or slightly later because that's when the objects are datable to. And I'm just starting to wonder whether some of what we're seeing in the burial is stuff coming from before. This is traditional ways. This is new stuff coming in as well. And they are melding the two before the imposition of Christianity. Yeah, that sub-Roman lacuna is still there. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for talking to me. I'm going to turn now to Dr Claire Rainsford, who is a consultant specialist in archaeological faunal remains. We're going to talk about her paper in the Archaeological Journal, delightfully entitled One Hoof in the Grave. It's about animal remains as inhumation grave goods in early medieval eastern England. So welcome Claire. This paper, and your PhD in fact, identified certain biases and holes in the published research. Could you just explain what those were and what you were aiming for in this paper? Well, the paper was looking at basically animal remains, which were included as grave goods in 5th to 7th century graves. That was essentially the brief of my PhD topic. And when I started to look at this, it was very clear that the research field, people do a lot of talking about animals in early medieval graves and graveside sacrifices, essentially as an aspect of pagan belief. They only seem to talk about it sort of based on very specific data sets. Large cremation cemetery data sets like Spong Hill and Sanctum seem to be the go-to for almost any paper written on the topic. And the other way that people had looked at it before was sort of very species specific. So Boulevile and Fern published a number of influential articles on horse burial across this period. But pretty much nobody had actually taken an area of Britain and looked at how animals were occurring in cremation graves, how animals were occurring in inhumation graves, and how this was varying across that area. It was all sort of talked about as one homogenous practice based on one or two cemeteries. So essentially, I wanted to fill this gap in the research and say, OK, let's take a big synthetic data set from the grey literature and also from and also from primary data and sort of see if this practice does look exactly the same at every other cemetery as it does at Spong Hill, or whether, in fact, there's considerably more variation than people think they're seeing. So you suspected there would be much more variation if you looked at a wider data set. What approach did you take? I was looking at five counties across, basically within that core Eastern England area, where you get the earliest evidence and the best evidence for Anglo-Saxon pagan burial. That sort of Eastern seaboard area. So Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, and then Cambridgeshire and Essex. And I went through the historic environment records for those five counties and picked any cemetery which had been excavated or substantially reported post-1960 just in order to capture effectively some kind of modern excavation so I wasn't dealing with all the antiquarian inaccuracies and inconsistencies in reporting. I was looking for any cemetery with a start date within the 5th to 7th century and frankly from that as well, any cemetery where I could actually get the data because when you look through the HERs there's also plenty of gaps where something has been a grey literature site but the data has never been put on the archaeological data service or online anywhere. And at that point, it's just extremely hard to get to. So out of that category, that yielded me about 46 cemeteries overall in this area, which seemed a reasonable size of data set. And how many burials was that? 
it totaled about 3,800 inhumation burials and about 5,000 cremation burials. But what I did sort of within that, for cremation burials, it's fairly straightforward to work out if they've got animals deliberately with them because the animal remains will be burnt in the same way as the human remains are burnt. For inhumations, it's a lot more complicated because you have a lot of redeposition of animal bones in cemeteries and you have animal bones coming into the grave filled. And I always felt that these were probably confusing the data set. So bones had to fit into these quite stringent criteria in order to actually count within my data set. Essentially, it had to be that they were positioned very closely alongside the skeleton and preferably that they were an associated bone group. So a collection of bones from the same animal together in that grave or that they were clearly curated bone so worked in some way or perforated in some way and included next to the skeleton there were one or two circumstances in the data set where it was clear that a single bone position next to the skeleton was also part of the same thing so that gave you clarity on the animal remains as associated grave goods people had been talking about this in a very complicated way previously and it seemed that there was very unique patterning in it immediately i applied this it seemed to clarify the data set a great deal just by reducing its size but also it pulled out the same kind of deposits again and again right so having established which faunal remains were actually grave goods what does the evidence look like This paper is focusing very much on the inhumation burials. This is the data which has really not been synthesised. These three case study cemeteries I picked was actually because they comprised the most amount of data from inhumations that I got. Most other cemeteries had one or two burials with animal remains in. These were cemeteries with quite large collections with animal bones in the graves. So the three case studies I had to look at were Castle Dyke South in Lincolnshire. The original report was by Rebecca Nicholson, and so that data was all published, and I was just taking grey literature data, and I didn't actually go back and look at the primary data myself. That was sort of up towards the top in North Lincolnshire, and what seemed to be going on there is that you had sometimes small portions of meat from pigs and from sheep, but particularly a collection of chickens placed in the graves of predominantly women with some children and adolescents. And what was quite interesting about Castle Dyke South is that it's quite late, mostly in those burials dated between 6th to 7th centuries rather than the earlier burials. The second study I looked at was Lake and Heath in Suffolk. That's a very big cemetery which is currently being published by Joe Caruth and John Hines and Joe Caruth has been incredibly helpful in giving me data and working with me on this and very very generous with her time on that so I'm very grateful to her. The initial report on the animal bone was done by Terry O'Connor who very generously gave me his grey literature report and I then took that and essentially went through it with Joe Carruth to establish a set of burials with animal bones being used as grave goods. What came out was completely fascinating. We have a horse burial. I think there's a couple of horse burials at Lake and Heath, but particularly there seems to be a pattern that it's young males being buried with predominantly sheep and predominantly what's fascinating is firstly these sheep are clearly portioned out so you've got sort of a sheep foreleg or half a sheep cranium and what's also particularly fascinating is that some of these graves clearly have more than one portion of sheep which is probably the same sheep but you don't know actually going into the grave and that's the first time that that's been very clearly seen in Anglo-Saxon burial and I'm deeply suspicious that the same thing is happening in cremations but it's much harder to see with the burnt bone and without the position information. But what's fascinating about that is that it clearly shows that the animals were almost certainly being slaughtered and portioned very close to the time that they're buried in the grave because you don't leave half a sheep head sitting around fermenting before you put it in the grave. And what's particularly fascinating with that is that if some portions of non-preserved and recently slaughtered meat are going into a grave, then the rest of the portions have to be going somewhere as well. So immediately you get into a situation where you're thinking about, hang on, this is a community practice. This is meat potentially from a funeral feast, potentially brought by some mourners, which is then being distributed elsewhere around the community. 
where is the rest of that going? And immediately it brings the sort of that social dimension back into it rather than this being confined to just the person in the grave. And they were all the young males? At Lake and Heath as well, it was, it was mostly young, but it was also there was one elderly female who had clearly transgressed this pattern and had also bits of sheep within her grave. That was quite interesting, the fact that there was one grave transgressing what was quite otherwise quite a clear pattern. The third one was Oakington. Oakington is in Cambridgeshire. There's been two seasons of excavation at Oakington. The first one, which is the data I predominantly looked at, was the Taylor et al. excavations in back in the 1990s, where there was a published report for this, which the animal bone was scarcely reported. So I went back and looked at the primary data for that in Cambridgeshire archives. But also there was a second, much more extensive season of work by Duncan Sayer and Jim Morris, which is the reasonably well-known one where they found a big cow and several horse burials, which James Nottingham did quite a lot of work on the animal bone from graves in that cemetery and was kind enough to allow me to refer to his work on that. But particularly in that Taylor, when I went back to look at the data from the 1990s excavations, What was particularly fascinating about Oakington is that there were four graves within that cemetery where there was a single articulated sheep forefoot put in with the burial. Why a forefoot? A sheep forefoot does not have a great deal of meat on it. It's not exactly a tasty joint. It's pretty much all hoof and fluff and sinew. So this is clearly not a meat joint going into the burial and it's always the single and articulated forefoot going into it. All four were in graves with women and children. Three of them I had the location for and those three were all positioned sort of almost next to each other alongside a ditch which was running through the cemetery. But what really struck me about this is that firstly because this isn't a meat deposit there's something unusual and to do with belief or potentially amuletic properties going on with this and also that while it's a very strong belief that women need a sheep for it has to be quite a profound belief if you're going to put one in a grave with them it only seems to have been relevant to a very small part of the Oakington community only four graves within that cemetery seem to show this but three of those four graves are very tightly clumped together so at that point you start to wonder are we looking at a sub-community within the cemetery for which that's relevant there are all sorts of other slightly odd things going on at Oakington like the complete cow burial (laughs) buried with a woman elsewhere in the cemetery there's at least two partial horse skeletons which don't seem to be associated with burials at all the three case studies sound really quite different Is there a narrative to be told or was everything very local? What really struck me about these three case studies, looking at them, is that you've got three different cemeteries within quite a restricted area. There's still not a great deal of geographical boundaries between southern Suffolk and northern Lincolnshire. It's all quite flat running through there. So you can imagine it's all quite a relatively connected area. But there seem to be very distinctive practices at each of these cemeteries in how animal remains were used within communities in the cemetery. With Lake and Heath, the practice is very definitely around meat portions and restricted to young men. At Oakington, there seems to be more of a ritual dimension to it, and it's associated with females. At Castle Dyke, it's associated with females and juveniles, but it seems to be meat portions, but more particularly chickens seem to have more of a role in that cemetery. They're part of an overarching practice where sometimes animal remains are good things to sacrifice at the graveside and to put into graves. But the way you do that and the choices of animals and the choices of who it's put with seem to be localised potentially to cemetery, potentially also because the prevalence is so low to particular sub-communities within that cemetery. And how those sub-communities are defined is, I think, a really interesting question because they seem to be defined partly on age and sex, but there are also plenty of young men at, at Lake and Heath who didn't get any kind of animal at all. And similarly, there are plenty of women and children at Oakington who did not get a forefoot 
So whether these are some kind of kinship group um, or whether this is to do with wealth or geographical origins would be absolutely fascinating to find out. The other thing about it is that all of the three cemeteries, even though you've got these very localised practices going on, they seem to also at points pick up sort of practices which are much more geographically widespread across the country, particularly horse burial and the use of curated bone amulets seem to have a significance which goes beyond the cemetery. Horse burials and the burial of in particularly human and complete horse seems to be something which is used in cemeteries across that area and across the country. And in inhumation cemeteries is more often associated with younger males. There were horse burials which fitted into that pattern at Lake and Heath. And I think in each one of the cemeteries as well, the curated bone is particularly interesting because these amulets, well, you can call them amulets, they are curated bone, which seems to be on the body for no necessarily discernible process apart from possibly decorative or in some ways amuletic or otherwise to do with apotropaic practices. And these are often things like pig teeth or beaver teeth or bird claws, things which in some ways sort of symbolise some of the characteristics of the animal. And what's particularly interesting about these is that the categories that are used, again, seem to be quite widespread across different cemeteries. It's the same kind of animals. They also seem almost exclusively to be associated with women and with juveniles, particularly the ones that are perforated or in some ways worn or mounted. And again, there were examples at Lake and Heath. And I think probably also examples of Tokington, which fitted in with that pattern. And it seems to be that there's a widespread belief that these kind of animal remains are appropriate for putting with this kind of person in that burial. So alongside these local practices, the same cemeteries also tie into much more widespread conceptions of animals and conceptions of the way animals are used. So it looks like there were wider conceptions across different communities. What are the new questions that you need to ask now? What do you need to do next? If you're looking at Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, there's a tendency to look at the eastern side of Britain because that's where the most of the cremation cemeteries are. By the time you get into the Midlands, out of that kind of core cremation zone, and then again further west, and things change a bit more slowly over that 5th to 7th century period. There's a lot more inhumation, there's a lot more mixed cremation, inhumation cemeteries, many more smaller cremation and inhumation cemeteries. And it would be really interesting to see essentially how things change in other areas of the country, whether you're seeing the same kind of things that we've seen on the eastern seaboard, or whether actually moving further west. It'd be fascinating to see looking backwards if there are bits of Roman Britain hanging on and different perceptions of animals from Roman Britain, which sort of continue through into this period. There's also new Anglo-Saxon cemeteries being excavated in the east of the country the whole time. And it would be really interesting to see how they fit, because in some ways the prevalence of animal bone and inhumation cemeteries in graves is so low that any new data set could change what we think we know. It's a really open game at the moment. Essentially, I'd be really interested to see both more data from the East and also whether there's any continuity going on in the West. And how do you think this research can expand? There's more work has done on it. There's people starting to work on this already. Lucy Sladen is doing her PhD at UCL at the moment and is looking at a variety of areas and animal bones in graves, but with a much wider geographical spread. So I'll be fascinated to see what's coming out of her research, and I'm very excited about that. I think in some ways this area is actually quite under-researched. The more that can be done on it to start to tie things together and to do that kind of synthetic work and to look at it with hopefully sort of proper criteria with a view to distinguishing what's actually being put in the graves and inhumations and what's there accidentally as clasps. I think it's just going to improve what we know about it. There's been a tendency, particularly with inhumation cemeteries, because animal bone isn't shiny. It's almost been ignored, but actually, if you think about it, a belt buckle probably cost a certain amount. An entire sheep or an entire cow or an entire horse is a very big sacrifice of wealth. 
going into that grave. So actually, while we might not see it on the surface, and it might not look very expensive to us coming into it as modern day archaeologists, this stuff was actually really important in the past and could actually have been the most expensive thing going into that grave as well as having impacts on being able to define mortuary feasting and community with the fact that some of these things are clearly going in as portions. So it's not just one belt buckle being put in with one person. It's a practice which could be tying together a community. So I think it's really important. And I think essentially almost anything which is done on it would be very exciting at the moment. And If the paper can sort of spark more people into looking at it, that would be wonderful, frankly. (laughs) Thank you very much for joining me, Claire. Now I'm going to move away from cremation burials and to the continent, in fact. I'm joined now by Femke Lippok of Leiden University in the Netherlands. Femke's paper, The Pyre and the Grave, was recently published in World Archaeology and it sought to better understand the diversity of early medieval burial practices in and around the Netherlands. So welcome, Femke. You have identified quite a sizable problem in the narrative interpretations of early medieval burial practices. Could you just set out that problem first of all? My interest in the subject was sparked when examining the early medieval cemetery of Gennep, which is in the Netherlands. And at Gennep we find inhumation graves and cremation graves. I was told that the cremation graves were late Roman and that the inhumation graves were early medieval. So I started wondering, why is there this strong conviction that these cremation burials have to be late Roman? Why is there not a possibility of them also being early medieval, given the context? And so I started doing C14 dates for those cremation burials, and it turned out that they were late Roman. <laughs> But that did leave me still with that question of that strong conviction. I wanted to know where does that conviction come from? What is it built on? And when in later work as a research master's student, our research group started compiling this background map of early medieval sites. And that has been built on work by our professor, Franz Theus, who's had a lifetime of collecting these sites. And we finally started uh, putting them on the map. We'd record cemeteries, settlements, stray finds. And for the cemeteries, we'd also look into how many graves are there. And again and again, cremations would pop up. And these would not be late Roman cremations. They would be early medieval cremations. And that's really what led me to wanting to properly research these graves. And that's why I started collecting the basic data, because there was nothing in our research area. My research area is the Netherlands, Belgium, the German Rhineland, and I've expanded into northern France now. Um, Lots of research has been done in England about early medieval cremations in northern Germany, but for my research area, there was no overview. So that's what I started doing, based on this idea of why are people so convinced that cremations cannot be early medieval. Right, so how are the cremation burials usually represented in the archaeological literature? I read all I could find on the interpretation of cremation burials and found that they were often set in opposition to inhumations. So often inhumations were privileged over cremations as being high status, a new development in the light of a Christian development. And as it turns out, mortuary archaeology in the early Middle Ages, in my research area, is dominated by one narrative of developing burial practices. And that is that cremations are abandoned in favor of furnished inhumations for a variety of reasons. Mm, So what were the consequences of that? So when archaeologists encountered early medieval cremations, they'd either dismiss them as a minority right or misdate them. The idea being when you encounter a cremation, it has to be prehistoric because according to the narrative, early medieval cremations don't exist. And that's when we get into the visibility of cremations in archaeology as well. Obviously, because it's cremated bone, it's more fragile. Often cremations are higher in the topsoil in our archaeology. And so they're more prone to being disturbed by later processes. Definitely in the Netherlands, as we're a very uh, processed country, I would say. This is also further obscured 
by a very interesting thing that early medieval people did. My colleagues in Belgium have discovered a prehistoric site with Iron Age urns, and they decided to see 14 days the cremated remains in those Iron Age urns. It turns out that one of them is early medieval. So what early medieval people sometimes did is reuse what we look at as Iron Age urns. So the data that I've collected for this paper is just the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be so much more. So it was important to do this research because of that homogeneic image that was painted of early medieval mortuary rites. Everybody was concentrating on furnished inhumations. And what I saw was that instead of telling the story from the evidence, that the archaeology was being molded into an old narrative. So how diverse is the evidence, in fact? Are there patterns? What I found through collecting all of these cremation sites is that it's actually a very diverse picture. There's not one way of doing a cremation on a site. And that made me very happy because I like diversity. So early medieval cremations occur on sites between the 5th and the 9th centuries. They are found in pots and pits, dispersed in pyre-like graves, mostly on cemeteries, but also in and around settlements. For example, there is a site at Oosgees, which is near to Leiden in the Netherlands, where we found a cremation in a water well, which is really cool. The cremations are found inside inhumation coffins, on the lids of coffins and on top of horse burials, as at Greifoldstratum and Lunen in Germany. But most strikingly, they hardly occur without inhumation graves. So if there's a cremation, early medieval cremation grave, it's very likely that there's also going to be an early medieval inhumation grave. Well, that seems quite pivotal. That has led me to believe that instead of looking at these graves being oppositional, as the meta-narrative suggests, we should see them as complementary. So they occur at the same time on the same cemeteries and were probably put there by the same burial communities. So looking at these graves as oppositional is not productive. That's further shown in more comparability. For example, not only are they found in the same spaces, the same kinds of objects are found with cremations and inhumations. In cremations, obviously, they're more often burned, but they're the same material culture, essentially. There's no differentiation between male or female or any ages. Males, females of all ages are buried as inhumations, but also cremated. So there's no differentiation there. And if you look at the spatial development of the necrogeographies of cemeteries, sometimes in the early Middle Ages, people would erect mounds over burials. And that happens with cremations and inhumations. So if you imagine walking over such a cemetery, you'd see a mound and you wouldn't be able to distinguish if something was a cremation or an inhumation. And so I wanted to get away from the oppositional character and just look at it as a whole. And looking at some specific sites has helped me in that. Okay, let's get to the specific sites then. What are those case studies? I love this one site. And when I was a student, this was also one of the sites that really helped me think about this problem and really made me think, oh, I'm onto something here, which is the site of Groppendonk in Belgium. And that's only a very small early medieval cemetery, 6th to 7th century. There's only one cremation burial and the rest of them are inhumation burials, but it's a very special cremation burial. It's the burial of a man and a woman aged around 40 to 50 years old, both of them. And with them, we find a very specific pot with a very specific decoration on it. This is a very special burial because on the same site, we find an inhumation burial, again, with two people in it, a man and a woman aged 40 to 50 years old. And there's an identical pot with identical decoration in that inhumation burial. And this was one of the graves that made me think, hey, these cremation and inhumation burials are not so different at all. We should look at it from a comparability perspective instead of an oppositional perspective. And that's why I like using Robbedonk for this example, because it's just so perfect, but it applies to other cemeteries as well. I've looked at the cemetery of Elst in the Netherlands, where we see a lot of comparability in beads and pottery and other glass vessels being used both in cremation and inhumation burials. 
the cemetery of Lunen, which is especially interesting because we find inhumation burials there and cremation burials. And the cremation burials, some of them, I think are very special because they look like inhumation burials. I spoke to the excavators and they thought, oh, we just have another inhumation burial there. The grave goods are laid out the same way in a rectangular pit as if it were an inhumation burial, but instead of unburned bones, we find cremated bones dispersed throughout the pit. So it's almost like they went to great lengths to almost make it look like an inhumation burial, but then there's two cremated people in there, a woman and a young boy. Of course, everybody always says, oh, maybe it's her son, but we can't say that with certainty. So the grand narrative breaks down in the face of the actual evidence. How should we be looking at these burial practices now? I had hoped to create a shift in perspective, away from homogeneic and towards the more archaeology-focused, inclusive and heterogeneous consideration of burial practices. And as such, I see cremations, I love cremations, but I also see them as a proxy to show what's wrong with our way of thinking about early medieval burial practices and that it's focused on one type of burial. And so what I'd like to see and what I try to develop myself is an inclusive way of looking at burial practices, incorporating cremation burials, incorporating, for example, crowd burials, but also unfurnished inhumation burials that are often forgotten because it's harder to tell a story about them. If you have a burial without any objects in them, what are you going to say about it? It's hard to date them. It's hard to explain them, especially if you think about this idea that we're going from cremations to furnished inhumations. Unfurnished inhumations don't fit in that story, so we can't explain them, and that's why we leave them out. But my perspective is that if you leave minority rights out, you are not telling the whole story. I mean, I think that's what we should aim to do, tell the complete story as as well as we can do from the evidence that we have. So all of these minority rights, that's what they call them, are part of the mortuary framework and we can only understand the early Middle Ages if we incorporate all of them and consider all of them. And how do you plan to develop your interpretations next? So one of the problems that I encountered during my research on cremations is the way that the past is seen currently. And what I've noticed that people think of the past as a collection of neat processes with a defined end and beginning. So archaeologists, I think, are used to thinking of the past as in set time frames and then certain behaviors and certain material culture belongs in one time frame and other behaviors and other material culture belongs in the other time frame. And that obviously has allowed us to tell a story of the past and date are fine. So it's been very helpful. But my work has shown how problematic that way of thinking is classifying practices as something of the past, even though they're still being practiced. This takes away agency from the people of the past and tells a story in a very homogenized way. And in my opinion, we need to rethink the idea of change in archaeology. So we need to get away from schemes of blocks of time with very rapid changes at the end of the blocks of time and think of change in a more gradual way, in a more inclusive way. So currently I'm working on my PhD and I'm researching how change in early medieval cemeteries comes about. So I'm looking at 56th century cemeteries, looking at the burial practices on them, obviously including all the diversity on them, but also looking at how these practices change gradually. I'm part of a project which is called Rural Riches, and the Rural Riches project aims to rediscover the early medieval economic development. That's a whole different problem, which has to do, again, about agency of the rural populations, because in the past it's always been thought that the development of the early medieval economy comes about through elites coming from the outside, telling local people what to do. But actually, when we look at the wealth and the number of objects in the graves of early medieval people from the 5th and 6th century, it is overwhelming. 
And there's so many of these cemeteries, so many of these wealthy graves, that it's hard to conceptualize them as all coming from elite persons. So what we think actually is that we're looking at a group of rural people who are very savvy and who can actually fend for themselves very well. Yeah, so this is a new perspective on early medieval economies. And my part in it is looking at developing burial practices because uh, we have to consider why people were putting objects in their graves and why did they decide to put so many and so many valuable objects in their graves? And are we looking at an economic phenomenon or is it a thing of the burial practices? And at the same time, I'm still working on cremation burials together with Professor Howard Williams. Uh, I am creating a distinctive book project with the latest expert views on early medieval cremations throughout Northwestern Europe. And we're doing this actually through uh, structured interviews. So like I'm talking to you now, creating awareness in other archaeologists that, hey, we're not just looking at furnished inhumations in the early Middle Ages. There's so much more creating a better understanding of these societies in the past. Well, it's not easy to shift the paradigm, but the evidence and the research does seem to demand it now. The overall benefit of this research is that I want to tell a more inclusive story of the past, which is probably more accurate as well, and breaking a century-long hold on these interpretations. That's also one of the problems with them, because the interpretations have always been this way. And so it's really hard to argue against them, because you're not only arguing against one professor, you're arguing against... 50. <laughs> so uh, it's good to get this out there and I'm really excited about it. I can tell. Thank you very much for joining me, Femke Lippock. And thanks again to Sue Harrington and Claire Rainsford. And you can follow up on all these publications on the website. Please become a patron of the show for just $2 a month. Go to the website and click the patron button. Foreigncountries.podbean.com So that brings us to the end of this episode of Foreign Countries. Join me next time for another conversation. Mm